just sort that out. That should be recording now, yes, and I shall mute myself. Brilliant. Thanks, Gareth. Um, yes, hi, everybody. So I'm Heather Devi. Um, I've been the Cumbria Beaver Project Officer for the past couple of years. But before that, I worked quite loosely with beavers up in Scotland as well, particularly on the Banff Estate in Perthshire. And that's where a lot of the photos from tonight will come from. Um, it's a wonderful site if you haven't been. So now I'm working with Wild Ennerdale with their exciting proposal to reintroduce beavers on a landscape scale into the Ennerdale Valley. But Gareth will explain more about that. What I'm going to do tonight is just give a, a, a very, very quick general overview of beavers, what a beaver is, because of course we've not had them around for centuries now. So we're all a little bit out of touch and they didn't feature very much in our cultural heritage, um, in literature and even in film really, there's a lot of misconceptions out there. So we'll just cover some of those really and uh, we'll, we'll all get on that nice level playing field where we feel a bit more comfortable to talk about beavers together. So I'll just share my screen. I should say as well, um, if you've got any questions at all, feel free to put them in the chat bar. Um, I'm just going to try and work this again, sorry. There we go. Sorry, bear with me. Okay, hopefully you can all see that. Just let me know if you can't, Gareth. Um, yeah, so what is a beaver? So when we're talking about beavers tonight, we're going to talk about Eurasian beavers. So that's castor fiber. So it's not their North American cousin, uh, castor canadensis. Um, it's only Eurasian beavers that we're talking about when it comes to Britain. It's only that particular species. And why do we actually need to reintroduce them in the first place? So we did actually hunt beavers to extinction. So we're, we have a sort of obligation to return them from where, where they used to roam in the wilds. So we hunted them primarily for three things, their meat, their fur, and their costorium. So their meat in particular, beavers were um, classified essentially as a fish in the medieval period, which meant that they could be eaten. So it started off with their tails being eaten during periods of Lent. And then if you've ever come across a beaver, they're quite a bit chunkier than your, your average fish. So they've got a good load of meat on them. So they were hunted quite heavily for, for meat in that particular era. Um, their castorium. Now I could talk about castorium for days, but that's because I'm a bit of a beaver nerd and I won't sicken you with the, in, the true ins and outs of it, but it's fascinating stuff really. So castorium is produced within, um, beaver's castor sacs, which are internal in, in male and female beavers. And it's essentially an, an oil-like secretion that helps with uh, their scent marking in particular. And they've got compounds within them that help identify, just let someone in there, um, that help identify individual beavers and colonies. So they can, a bit like badgers, they can kind of identify who's who through this amazing castorium. And it's thought as well that they do have some kind of waterproofing qualities. So when you watch a beaver, they will actually rub this castorium all across their body. Um, but unfortunately, we found other uses for it. Um, traditionally, it was used for a um, pain reliever. So beavers eat a lot of willow and there's compounds within that that we now use for aspirin. Um, so that, you know, there is some kind of truth within that. But thankfully, now we have aspirin. Um, and we used it as a vanilla substitute. In fact, we do still use it in some parts of the world as a vanilla substitute and uh, in perfumes and lots of things like that. So they are still hunted um, in Europe and North America for their castorium in some locations for their meat, but they are still also hunted for their pelts. And traditionally, it was actually the, the fur industry that really drove them to extinction. So beavers have a really thick, beautiful fur um, and a postage size piece of beaver skin actually has more fur on it than the whole human head. That's how densely packed it is. So it's brilliant to keep them warm and to keep them waterproofed underwater. But again, we found another use for it. So beaver pelts, once you remove the top guard hairs, if you apply particular chemicals to it, it can actually be created into a felt 
and felt beaver hats became high fashion, particularly in the kind of 1550s to the, to the early 1800s. Um, and this fashion just did not die down. And the brilliant thing, unfortunately, about beaver fur is that it can be manipulated into lots of different styles. So all of the hats on the left there are kind of modifications of what a beaver hat can become. And they can be uh, turned into different colors, different styles to suit the kind of upper classes. So once we exhausted our beavers in Britain, we headed across to Europe, but unfortunately a lot of that population had already been hunted to near extinction by the Europeans. And then we kind of joined the Europeans across to the North Americas to start um, trading in their beaver pelts. And it's really fascinating because although we don't have much of an understanding of our relationship with beavers historically now, we're actually really heavily integrated with beavers throughout all of our evolution, essentially. We co-evolved with beavers. And then in the later years, they actually were really, really influential in our economy and how our economy evolved and adapted as well. So we have lost a lot of history when it comes to beavers. So it's quite important that we get back on the right track. So, and we, we kind of learn from a, a few mistakes, but we also kind of respect the fact that we do have misconceptions about beavers existing um, and, and talking about those and kind of getting the truth out so that we can welcome them back for the benefit of beavers, but also for ourselves. So, so what is a beaver? I've got a bit of a cough, sorry. So I'm gonna keep drinking my tea. So beavers are <clears throat> the second largest rodent in the world, trumped only by the capybara. Um, they're a semi-aquatic mammal. Now they're called a semi-aquatic mammal, but if you watch beavers, they're entirely dependent on water. So I'm, I'm hesitant to call them that. I'd go for aquatic mammal, really. Um, and they are monogamous. So they tend to breed as a pair for life, if conditions allow. And as a family unit, they'll tend to be two, two adult individuals um, with two years worth of young living with that particular family unit. And they can have comfortably two to three kits per year. So they're called kits, the young. Um, and they'll have family units of comfortably, again, around about eight to 12 individuals. But again, a bit similar to badgers. You can tell I work with badgers quite a lot as well. These colonies can expand if uh, the, the resources, the food and the, the habitat allows for that. So beavers adapted, they evolved to be entirely dependent on water and to actually adapt their lifestyles in order to create water sources. The very low maintenance beavers when it comes to their wetland creation, they, they create their own wetlands in turn, they create their own habitat and their food resources. So in that sense, they create what they need almost entirely from scratch at times. And their anatomy is entirely evolved around that. So if we have a closer look, we've had a look at the fur already. It's really dense. They've got these thick guard hairs on top to help with waterproofing. Their tail, they've got a paddle tail, paddle-like tail, I should say, um, that kind of acts as a rudder to help them maneuver underwater. And it really, it's really, really strong. It's full of muscle, so it's um, a really great aid when they're swimming underwater. They use it as a balance as well. So if you watch beavers when they're carrying their building materials, they do have a bit of a waddle when they're carrying the materials over land because they can walk on their hind feet and it kind of counteracts that um, weight at the front. They slap it on the surface of the water as an alarm mechanism. They store fat in it. So the fatter a beaver's tail is, the healthier it tends to be as an individual and they regulate temperature through it. So they exude heat through it in the summer. Um, so it's multifaceted, the beaver tail, brilliant thing. Their hind feet are webbed to aid with swimming, but their far feet, I always have a habit of calling them hands um, because they're incredibly tactile animals. They're really, really social. I've got a very, uh, very socially dominated kind of uh, living system and they groom each other with their hands. They'll use them to, to maneuver feeding resources and to grab them and to, to you know, break um, 
vegetation away from the ground. So they're really well adapted in that sense, but they're not webbed. They also use them, as we'll see a bit later, to dig out channels. So brilliant things. Um, their faces, you see how they've got all of those key kind of attributes, the nose, the eyes and the ears, all at that kind of upper level. And that tends to be all you see of a beaver when it's in the water, if you're lucky to see it when it's in the water, because they can be incredibly um, well camouflaged. So they've got all of those key features of above the water. And again, with them being adapted to live in the water, they can actually survive underwater for, to, for just over 15 minutes. And that is because their ears have a mechanism within them that folds flat to prevent water from entering. Uh, they've got a nictum membrane, so essentially like goggles to help them go underwater. And there's also some evidence to show that these goggles help improve their eyesight when they go underwater too so that they can see where they're going, they can look for the, the, the forage. Their nostrils close when they dive. And they've got this really amazing kind of, almost like a second pair of lips, if you like, behind their teeth that closes when they dive underwater. So they can still grab feeding resources, branches and things with their teeth without the water going into their throats. And the teeth themselves, brilliant things when you see them just like in cartoons, really, that that really bright yellow orange, that's because they're impregnated with iron on the surface of the, um, the incisors. But behind them, they've got soft dentine, which wears away with use. And because beaver teeth grow continuously, they need to, not, to gnaw trees in order to keep them at bay. And essentially, when they start doing that, when they're young, they create these chisels. So they create their own chisels, perfect for gnawing wood. So these are just some of the adaptations really that beavers, beaver bodies have adapted to have to make them the perfect um, aquatic engineers, if you like, and entirely suited and entirely dependent on the presence of water. So because of all of this, beavers are ecosystem engineers. So you might've heard that term before, um, engineering ecosystems and when it comes to the beavers they're engineering engineering wetland ecosystems and because of, of their uh, skills in wetland creation they're also a keystone species so this is one that has a, an overall larger impact on on biodiversity and the environment and living organisms than one would usually allow so we're a hyper keystone species we've got a very very big impact uh, salmon a keystone species there's lots of uh, keystone species out there but the beaver is arguably of course my favorite and we'll have a look at why that is so these pictures are taken from the Banff estate in Perthshire <clears throat> just have a sip of my tea sorry so <clears throat> beavers are ecosystem engineers essentially because of their incredible architectural skills so first of all we'll have a quick look at their lodges uh, which is what they sleep in, they raise their young in, they've got different chambers inside and they tend to have, well they always have, an underwater entrance as well. So traditionally in Britain and still across Europe, beavers, um, their main predators are, are wolves. Um, wolves are very clever things so they, they learn to hunt the kits from quite a young age. Bears and lynx primarily here in Britain, I've actually seen um, a dog otter, a, a big adult male otter, try and go for a beaver kit on the, the River Tear. But as soon as the beaver adult came along, um, the, the kit actually went into the lodge, went under the water into the lodge and escaped the otter. And mum or dad, beavers don't have external genitals, so they're actually really hard to sex, uh, to identify the sex in the, in the flesh. So either mum or dad scared it away. So when it comes to the lodges, really, really important habitats for them to have, of course. And just like their dams that we'll have a look at, they like to create them with their own uh, building materials. So they'll, they'll fell a tree, they'll take off the upper branches, they'll strip away the bark and they'll have a good chew. Um, they'll, they'll eat the nourishing parts of it where they can. 
And then they'll pack it in with mud and sometimes stones, whatever might be available, natural resources that are available. They'll pack it in and make it nice and dense. They'll have that underwater entrance. Additionally, or instead of that, particularly on riverbanks, beavers uh, will create burrows instead. So this picture I was able to take again at Banff because there'd been a really heavy uh, flood event which actually flushed out one of the dams. And on that night that I just so happened to be there, the water left. So we were able to see inside of the, uh, the, the tunneling systems as well as the channels. It's worth noting that the beavers actually fixed that entire dam within three nights. So they're really quick workers as well. And that was during the heavy rain. It was very impressive to see. So beavers will tend to have uh, two or three lodges or burrows per territory, um, particularly during the, the breeding season, they might set up a new burrow, um, but that it varies on the habitat in particular. In Ennerdale, we'd imagine lodges, of course, which are always exciting to come across. Now, when it comes to the architecture that beavers are mainly known for, of course, that's their dams. And when we talk about dams, it's not the dams that humans are known for creating, where they're really straight edged. They don't generally allow the flow of water. If they burst, that's it. You know, it's going to take some time to, to fix. Beavers have a different system in place when it comes to creating dams. So first of all, they use natural resources, of course. So they've got uh, the sticks where they fell the trees. They'll take the sticks. They pack it in with mud. And they create this really kind of interwoven, uh, beautiful layer, I suppose, that, that can be, it varies in thickness, it varies in height, but usually it's embedded a little bit into the riverbed itself. Then behind that, you will have a gradual buildup of silt, but that actually helps to fortify the dam over time in, in particular areas. You see how it's got this lovely curve to it as well. That's quite a standard structure when it comes to a beaver dam. And it's thought that that helps the protect the kind of integrity of the dam if there is a flash flood. So this section where the water is gushing over, actually, this is a section that some beavers fixed while I was at Banff in January oh, last year. I don't know. I've lost all track of time recently. So they fixed this very quickly and it was just that particular section where the, the stream water was hitting it with real force that burst. The rest of it remained in place and the beavers fixed it within three nights. So ahead of this series of dams, there's actually, um, I think by this point, there's five more dams. So when it comes to a dam, you don't tend to just get one in a tributary. You get a level of them. You get a stepped system. And it doesn't always happen as a, a straight stepped system. They can be, again, interwoven and beavers kind of decide on where they want the dams according to the behavior of the stream and the water course. And with that changing over time, the, the beaver habitats, the beaver wetlands are dynamic and they change over time as well. So every time that I go to the Banff estate, something is slightly different or sometimes drastically different. And again, that's, that's an exciting thing when it comes to beaver wetlands and it's brilliant for biodiversity. But this is one thing that can cause concern for people is the unpredictability of beavers and landscapes. But there are, there are kind of modeling systems that we can use to, to predict somewhat the impacts that beavers will have. So there's something called a dam capacity um, modeling system. There's a foraging index that can be applied so that we can estimate where beavers are likely to have impacts and what those impacts might be so that we can prepare for them basically arriving. So when you look at the water coming out of this dam, this picture really doesn't do it justice. Further upstream, because this is low-lying agricultural land, organic, but still agricultural land, further upstream, it's quite heavily um, farmed. So the water was running brown during this storm event. I think it was Storm Desmond or one of those. And by, by the time it had passed through this system of about six or seven dams, it was running as clear as this. So it's not just slowing the flow of the water downstream, which I didn't mention actually, sorry. So that the dams hold the water back, they pool it, 
and they compound it behind the dams, but they still allow that kind of leaky flow downstream. And during storm events, it's brilliant because it does just help kind of control the river just that little bit. And if beavers were on catchments, sorry, on a catchment scale, if these dams were on a catchment scale, you can imagine the impact that would have on just slowing the flow of water into the larger river systems, which then lead into towns. So near me, for example, there's Carlisle, and we face some very heavy floods, in particular because of the canalized systems that we have in some of the farmed landscapes. So they slow the flow of water downstream and they help improve um, the quality of the water as well, the health of the water. The channels, just make sure I'm leaving enough time for Gareth. The channels are amazing things and it's something that people don't often know about when it comes to beavers. So we see their lodges and we see their dams, but the channels are usually hidden under the water. And I was obviously able to get this one when that dam broke. So they dig them out with their, their forefeet and they do this in order to, to just allow the water into a, a kind of branched area, branched off away from a tributary so that they can access feeding resources or they can just reach this grazing ground. So you can see here, this is a, a um, beaver grazed lawn. It's a beaver lawn as it's called. And because they're entirely dependent on water for security, they're like a, a meter's depth of water usually to feel safe. These channels are really important to them um, to access new feeding resources, but they act as kind of transport networks as well. So because trees are quite heavy things, they'll fell a tree and they'll often chop it actually with their teeth into kind of bite-sized carryable chunks um, and then they'll take them to this kind of transport network and down to the dam or the lodge or whatever they need it to be. And overall this just helps improve what we call the heterogeneity of uh, a wetland, the, the ever-changing kind of dynamic system that lies within it, the living system. It adds to the complexity of it which helps overall with ecosystem services. And beavers do this for free, which is brilliant. Don't tell the beavers that. So the, they help to retain the water, which is brilliant. Of course, this week with COP26 going on, it's, it's quite topical really. They help to retain water during periods of drought, which is brilliant for wildlife, which we'll have a quick look at. They slow the flow of water downstream during other extreme weather events, these, these storm events that we're having increasingly. They help to filtrate water naturally, which is no bad thing at the moment in particular. And they help to sequester carbon. So it's thought that beaver, active beaver wetlands are three times more effective at actually sequestering carbon than standard wetland habitats. We only have 3% of our remaining wetlands in Britain now. Uh, but over 10% of species are entirely dependent on these habitats. And that's why beavers are a keystone species. They bring these habitats back and they manage them entirely themselves, really, for the benefit of themselves, ultimately for us, and also for a huge diversity of other wildlife. If we wanted to control their impacts, of course, there's a lot of mitigation tried and tested now across America and Europe and in Britain, in fact, so things like floor devices or beaver deceivers, which is a trademarked name, excellent. Essentially, it's a pipe where you put the top of the pipe to the level of the water that you want it to be. You put it through or on top of the dam, wherever that kind of sits and fits. And then it's got this cage around it to um, stop the beavers who have an impulse to dam flowing water on small tributaries. It stops them actually damming that pipe and they'll dam against the cage instead. And then we can have the benefits of beavers, um, but also we can we can continue our kind of human practices, whether it's a farmed, a farmed landscape next to it, a public footpath, whatever it might be, you can control the impacts of beavers and still have their, their brilliant impacts too. I did forget to mention, which is something that comes up, Beavers don't really dam large river systems. So I mentioned the Eden, um, they don't dam the large river systems. It tends to be just these small systems where they don't have a depth of water and um, the tributaries and the drainage ditches and things like that, that they feel encouraged to dam. Beavers are herbivores. There's a rumor out there 
that's ongoing thanks to C.S. Lewis and Mr. and Mrs. Beaver that beavers eat fish um, because she serves up a plate of fish and chips. Dreadful. Um, but they are entirely herbivorous, so they eat a, a huge range of aquatic and terrestrial plants. They graze grass um, and, of course, they fell trees. So autumn is their main tree felling activity. Um, tree felling activity period. And when we talk about them felling the trees, we do have these visions of kind of uh, destruction and trees being lost in our landscape completely. But in reality, what beavers do, these are from the Lowther estate now, which have a pair of beavers in an enclosure. What beavers actually do is they provide a service for us, a coppicing service. So I'll go back to this picture. This was taken just as soon as the beavers arrived in October last year. And then when I went uh, a couple of months back, this is the same tree and that beautiful regeneration has started to take hold. The only thing that's holding this back is actually deer. So the beavers allow this regrowth. They'll take the odd branch here and there, but they do allow this regrowth. They've co-adapted with trees. So they know that they need this resource to survive. And of course, this helps really create this lovely shrubby underlayer, something that's quite missing in a lot of our habitats. So we tend to have woodland, we might have farmland, we might have hay meadow. We don't generally have a succession of habitats a lot now. So this allows and encourages this succession of habitats, particularly along river edges which is brilliant for nesting birds. So this was on the River Perth and there were signs of nesting birds everywhere. And as well as that, there were signs of sparrowhawks. So of course, it's that ecosystem coming back into play. If we wanted to control that tree felling activity, we can install tree guards, which is essentially chicken wire, or we can put on a, a colored sand paint. Beavers wouldn't want to chew sanded paint, neither would we. And I, I personally find the sanded paint quite aesthetically pleasing. So the tree guards can be quite uh, obtrusive, I suppose, depending on where they are, if it's a community orchard or something. But these, the sanded paint option, you wouldn't really know that it was on. And very briefly, because I'm, I'm running out of time, I think, um, the wildlife that beavers bring back to these wetlands, it's documented thoroughly now that they generally increase the abundance and the diversity of wetland species. So fish, for example, there was a new report out from Scotland uh, last month, I believe it was. And that has finally kind of got, got some evidence in Scotland to show that beavers actually increase the abundance and the, the age composition of trout in these um, in the streams that beavers are in compared to the streams that beavers aren't in when they're heading into the same loch. And that again is because of the additional woody debris, it's because of the pooled systems, um, because of the extra nursery habitat that they create for the fish. I'd recommend looking that up if you're interested. And just like the, the Devon beaver trial on the River Otter, they found a 37% increase in fish abundance in their beaver pools compared to control sites. So when it comes to fish, um, this tends to be the main concern for people. So if you do have questions, just chat away with us at the end or put it in the chat box and we'd be happy to continue that. But when you look at a beaver wetland, it can look messy and nature is supposed to be messy. You've got standing deadwood that's got woodpecker holes in that bats have moved into. You've got freshwater invertebrates buzzing around that the bats feed on. You've got otters returning to the sites and water voles because they can evade the mink because of these dynamic channels they've created. Huge diversity of life returns and of course amphibians too. Beavers in Britain, we've got quite a few now, as it happens. Um, very, very brief overview. This is from the Beaver Trust website that I'd really recommend looking up. I don't think this map is interactive anymore, but it might be again soon. Basically, every green dot you can see is a free living beaver population. Every red dot is an enclosed beaver trial. And actually, since, since I took this screenshot, there's been new beaver introductions uh, in England, in uh, Nottingham, for example, which happened this week, I believe. So on the east there, that's Cropton Forest, uh, Forestry England site. 
and on the west that's the Lowther estate. We can talk about the tear population of beavers at the end if you're interested, but if you've heard any controversial issues about beavers, it will generally be surrounding that particular population. Um, so we, we can chat about that at the end. And one thing that uh, would be brilliant for everybody to do, there's a DEFRA beaver consultation out, for, which is basically going to decide the future of free living beavers in England. So beavers in England currently have no legal protection, so they, they're hopefully going to sort that out. They're going to classify them um, as a protected species, hopefully. But it's basically for you to have your say, if you're a landowner, if you're an angler, if you're a member of the public, you can say what your opinion is on the return of beavers in England. Um, and I'd, it closes next Thursday, the 17th of November, and I would encourage you to take a look at it. You can check out my blog, if you like, which is actually at wildhorsewater.co.uk. Um, have a look at that, and the link to the consultation is in there. But if you have any questions about it, do just feel free to get in touch with me, um, and I'd be very happy to answer. That was a really, really quick overview because we want to leave as much time as possible for, for questions at the end and for you to raise any points that you might have. So I'm going to pass over to Gareth now, who's going to share Wild Ennardale's incredible vision for the reintroduction of beavers. And I will stop screen sharing. Thank you, Heather. That was really good. As always, I keep remembering things and thinking, oh yeah, I didn't know that. Even though I've watched your video, your presentation twice now, I still keep learning new things. So thank you, that's really good. So I'm going to now share a presentation about our proposals in the Ennardale Valley as to reintroducing beavers. So let me just find my presentation. Be here somewhere. There we go. Can you see that, Heather? Is that visible for you? Yes, it is. I don't think you can see me, Gareth. Yeah, I can see that. Brilliant. Thank you. OK, so I'll bring in. Just a bit of background in case you're uh, watching from outside of sort of Cumbria, West Cumbria, the Lake District, and, and aren't aware where Ennardale is. But Ennardale is in the northwest of Cumbria, on the northwestern edge of the Lake District. The Lake District in this picture is this middle area where it says Cumbria Mountains. And the, the Lake District National Park and the Lake District are very much like a cartwheel with valleys leading out from the centre of the mountain ranges. So the mountain range is centre is right over here. And then these different valleys lead out from that. And over on the western side, we have the valley that we call Ennardale. And the purple area shown on that, this map, is the outline of Wild Ennardale, which is the partnership that we're talking about here. So Wild Ennardale is a partnership between uh, National Trust, Forest England, United Utilities and Natural England. Uh, the first three are landowners in the valley, and Natural England is the government organisation responsible for conservation. And about 45 to 50 percent of the Ennardale Valley, what we think of wild Ennardale, is designated uh, at a national or European level for its special conservation values, its wildlife values. That's why Natural England is involved. So the partnership's been running since uh, about 2003. So it's nearly two decades since we formed the partnership and we've been having talks and discussions before that since about 2000. So you could say we're more than two decades uh, old as a partnership. As a partnership, we developed a vision in 2003, which is uh, on your screens now. And that's to allow the evolution of Endale as a wild valley for the benefit of people, allowing more natural processes to shape its landscape and ecology. So the important things there is it's, it's about people, but it's also about relying more on natural processes. So we, we think of ourselves as being having a natural process led management style. So we're really led by natural processes and we want to free up the natural processes that are there and restore those that should be there that for one reason or another aren't in the valley anymore. And it's really even within that context that we've decided that really beavers would be a natural process in the valley 
um, and we want to restore them. We've already um, sort of added to the valley uh, a natural land-based natural process, which is our cattle, our free roaming gallery cattle that wander the, 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 the valley and they do a disturbance process on the soil, on the land, on the dry land, but we don't have an equivalent in the river system. And beavers would do that. As Heather said, they are nature's uh, architects, they're nature's river architects. So that's where our reasoning for wanting to reduce beavers for what comes from really is that desire to have the full range of natural processes operating in the valley, both on the dry land parts and also on the wetter uh, waterways, streams, watercourses, river and lake. So our proposal is to establish free living beavers in Ennardale and really that's because free living is really the only natural process that we want. We're not after a zoo, we don't want beavers enclosed forever behind a fence. Our real vision is to have free living beavers in Ennardale but to have free living beavers in Ennardale we ultimately need to have free living beavers across the whole of the River Ian and Keekle catchments because we can't have beavers in Endale without any barriers, without the vision including the Ian and Keekle catchments. So effectively our, our, our vision is to have free living beavers in Endale and thus the Ian and Keekle catchments. And the way we want to go about that is that we recognise that communities living in that catchment haven't experienced beaver before. We as landowners in Endale haven't experienced beaver before. Some of us have seen them I've only seen them at night through uh, night binoculars on the Tay, uh, but we haven't experienced them any length of time and, and sort of had to manage with them and around them. So what we're proposing is an initial three to five year public engagement period when we would host beavers in the Ennardale Valley um, and they would be reintroduced to an area east of the lake and I'll come on to that a bit in, the, in a short period. So there'll be a three to five year period when we would host these beavers in Ennardale. They would get on and do their thing and we would learn what it's like to manage land around them. But we'd also invite landowners in the whole catchment to come and visit and see what they're doing. And we'd demonstrate mitigation measures during that period so that people can see how you can protect trees or prevent or reduce the impact of flooding that these beavers might have if they were on their land. We'll also Beavers will also be in an area of open access, so members of the public will be free to walk the valley and, and discover them for themselves. But we would also look to have a uh, beaver visitor experience ranger based in the valley who would uh, lead walks at dusk and dawn when they're most likely to be seen and be around to ask questions, as well as gathering information about what the beavers are doing, reporting that both online and social media, but also on a sort of welcome lodge uh, somewhere in the middle of the valley where the beavers are. Then after that three to five year period, uh, sometime during that three to five year period, three years three, four and five, when we think it's appropriate, we would then um, initiate another period of more formal public consultation and engagement, similar to what we're doing now, drop-ins, online, uh, in the forest, and that would culminate with the opportunity for people to really uh, share their views through uh, online consultation we would use uh, citizen space which uh, is a shared space that we use already as forest genome for our management plans and if the response from the, the community the wider community uh, the catchment and the wider community is that they would like to support free living uh, there is support for free living beavers then we wouldn't just open the gates and, and do nothing else we would then work with partners in the wider catchment to develop a vision and plan for this so there'll be another year or two after that initial uh, support, uh, evidence of support, when we would develop the vision for the next phase, the actual free living phase. However, if the response is not supportive from the community and the wider catchments, uh, catchment, then um, we would remove beavers from the valley. We don't want a permanently enclosed population. We don't want a zoo. So we would simply remove them uh, when, when we could. It might take a while. We need to find places for them to go but we would then initiate a, a, a plan to remove them rather than a plan to develop a vision to actually give them free living of the whole catchment. So it's that three key elements really to our proposal. So looking at what this might mean in terms of a map, then you can see on this map that the orange area is the area of Ennardale east of 
the lake where we would host the beavers for three to five years. It's about 2,600 hectares, within which uh, there's probably about 220 hectares of potential beaver habitat. That's habitat within 50 metres of a water course. They're very good, as, as Heather already said, as beaver architects, as nature's architects. They build dams, they build canals. So they may well find areas of habitat we haven't identified. But there is certainly over 200 hectares that they could access that's fairly close to watercourses. So that's quite a big enclosure. Most enclosures across the UK and England to date have been in the order of 5 to 20 hectares. This is 200 hectares. So it'd be a very big enclosure. So while it's not free living, they would have a lot of freedom to move around within that large enclosure. Um, so that's 200 hectares within that 2,600 hectares. And it's called a partial enclosure because we're only going to physically erect fencing and, and other um, barriers at the west end of that enclosure. We're not going to put anything on the ridges. The mountains themselves will stop beavers leaving the valley because beavers don't like to be very far from water, so they're not going to try and climb, walk all the way to the top of the ridge to get out. And then if we had a successful uh, public engagement period at the end of the three to five years and people said, yes, we'd like to see them, uh, we'd like to see what it meant to uh, allow them to expand into the whole catchment, then that would include the whole the green area. So that green area, shady green area, is the catchment for the River Ian and Keekle. It's about 13,000 hectares, so quite a lot bigger than the area that they would be in for the first three to five years. But that would happen slowly. It wouldn't suddenly happen. And, and we would say we would consult on the actual plan for that. It would just be an, uh, a sort of initiation at that three to five year period if there was support for the, the free living ideas. What have we already been doing? Well, we commissioned an independent expert-led ecology feasibility study, which was completed in 2020. And the report from that is on our, our website, www.wildnl.co.uk slash beavers. And that report reports that the valley would be suitable for a multi-family beaver release. There's lots of food in the valley, especially in an area between the lake and sort of the pillar, opposite pillar, that middle part of the valley. We've developed a vision and proposal for initial partial exclosure and then the wider free living release that I've shared with you. And uh, we've been testing a water gate across the Verlies and I'll speak about that later on. We've started to look for funding opportunities and partners who might fund us. And uh, along with this event, we've started public engagement to, get, to gauge what people feel across the catchment uh, about this initial uh, phase. So there's, Sometime next year, we would actually look to ask for formal consultation through citizen space where people have the opportunity to formally record their thoughts and their comments about this proposal. So what would the initial exclosure look like? It's partial exclosure we've talked about. So here you can see the Enderdale Valley. On the left hand side, you've got Enderdale Water, bonus not car park. And then going out to the right, you go past Past the Y chain, the field centre, just here where that little telephone box symbol is, is the field centre. And the Y chain is just here when my mouse is spinning. And then if you go further east, you head up towards the uh, pillar and then ultimately Great Gable. So we, the, the feasibility study has identified three sites where we could release a beaver family at each site. So we're looking at releasing three beaver families pretty much at the same time. So there'd be a site at Moss Dub where there's already a tarn, a small, uh, small uh, tarn, yeah, lake. And Gillithwaite Mire, which is a very, an area of wetland that our wonderful volunteers have been developing since we clear failed it 10, 20 years ago. They've been blocking drains and it's become a lovely wetland now. And there are pools of water there uh, which the beavers could use. We might have to dig a big, slightly bigger pond just for them to initially start in. And the same at Middle Bridge, there's a site here just below Middle Bridge where we've identified another small wetland, which we would need to dig a small pond. And really that those ponds are there not, not because beavers need help, but when they've been travelling from wherever they've been captured, they're in cages temporarily for a day or so, uh, as they're brought down from perhaps Scotland where we've caught them and brought them. So they have vet tests and just checked out, but they've got to be travelled down transported down so they get a bit stressed 
and a bit hot when they used to be in water. So the first thing they want is somewhere that they can escape to, a pool of water that they can just get cooler in, get to know their area, and then they'll start designing their own uh, dams and ponds and building their own canals. So it's just to give them something to cool off in. So that's where the three families would be released. And that might be anywhere between 12 and 15 uh, beavers in total with, with the adults and the young. So they would be in the middle valley. So to stop them leaving the middle valley, we would need some form of barrier here. And what we've been looking at is a series of fences um, where you've got the orange lines would be new fences. So this is a new fence up through the forest going high enough that the beaver just isn't going to want to be able to climb that far up to get around it. And then there'd be another uh, fence across the valley bottom where there already is a fence, a, a sheep stock fence, and we just need to upgrade that a bit so it's uh, beaver proof. And then and we need a new fence along the north side of the river Liza connecting uh, to, into a wall at this end here. And then we've got this water gate we're going to show you a bit more of across the river Liza itself. Bottom. So this is the Irish bridge that already exists across the River Liza. And this is the fence that's shown orange, this fence in the distance, this is shown orange, I think is it orange or green? I can't remember now, green. So that green fence is this fence in the background there, just going off down the side of the track. So that would be upgraded to Beaver and then we connect that fence into this Irish bridge, this already existing concrete structure. So you can see in the middle of this bridge, there's a a metal structure here and another metal structure here. So this is this uh, water gate that we've been testing. Um, and the way this is this works is it's got to do three things. It's got to allow gravel down to move downstream. So in a big storm event like you're seeing here where there's a lot of water coming down, the river actually starts to pick up gravel and, and rocks and boulders and roll them down the bed, the river bed. So they're sort of carried along the river bed deposited further downstream and that's really important because the arctic char that spawn between this bridge and the lake need that gravel to spawn into every year so we want that gravel to move through this structure freely as it does currently we also need it to keep beavers from getting out of the valley on the east side and finding the lake and ultimately the rest of the catchment and then finally it needs to be able to let spawning fish leave the lake and move up the valley, move up the river system to actually spawn and then drop back again. So how does he do that? Well, so we've been testing it and uh, I think we've got another picture a bit more close up. So this is a close up of the three test gates. So what these test gates are doing for us is showing us a number of things. So if you look at the, the metal in them, there's a gap and that gap's about 10 centimetres, which is the gap we need to have in place to prevent younger beavers uh, escaping through them. And then on, you'll see that the gates are separate and so they're sort of mounted on hinges. We want a, a system that isn't reliant on electronics, it just simply works physically. So these hinges here allow the gate to move up and down. And in a high flow, high river flow situation like we have here, the gates are moving and they're actually being lifted by the flow of the river. And the river, they're doing that because the river's hitting these baffles. See these big brown sheets of metal. So the river is hitting those and forcing the gate upwards. And what we've been doing is exploring what baffle works best and gives us the, the movement of the gate at the, at the same time as the gravel is being lifted, uh, carried by the river downstream. So what we want to do is we want these gates to lift and let the gravel go under them in a storm event. Now you might ask the question, well, won't the beavers get out at that point? And the answer is they shouldn't do because beavers aren't that strong a swimmer. They're very good swimmers, but they're not strong swimmers in, in a storm event. The water's moving really fast. There's lots of currents in the, uh, in, the, in the river. And there's also debris being carried down and boulders and gravel. So it's a, it's a bit of a cement mix of a river. Very clear, but lots of things being carried by it. And the beavers aren't going to want to be in the river at that time. It's not fun. There's a risk to their, their health and their safety. They're going to be huddled up in their lodges waiting for the storm to pass. So the fact that the gates lift during the storm shouldn't be a problem because the beavers just aren't going to be there. And remember from the, the map earlier, if we go back to the map, the beavers are actually going to be somewhere in the middle of the valley further up. There's not a lot of uh, habitat for them just upstream from the, from the, from the uh, bridge.
bridge and gauge structure, it's, it's almost canalized, so it's not that great for beavers. So the 10 centimeter um, grill keeps beavers from going downstream, but unfortunately it also keeps fish from coming upstream because the environment agency have told us they need a 14 centimeter grill. So what we propose to do is in, so sorry, so, but thank fish don't spawn all year round they typically spawn in october november through to january so what we're proposing to do is is swap out three of the gates uh into with grit with a grill that's 14 centimeters wide on the main channel during the spawning season so that fish can actually get up through the structure now that does leave a leave the gates leave a risk that the beavers could get downstream but by that time the younger beavers that were born that year will be bigger and fatter so less likely to get through the 14 centimeter gap and the adults should be too big to get through and also if again if you look at the map they'll be further upstream they'll have found their territories they'll have found each other they won't need to want to come all the way down to this concrete structure they'll have already discovered they can't get out and there's plenty of other habitat to look at so hopefully they'll just be looking around that during those three months but we will have to have uh, an escape, catch and release policy as part of the license that we have to apply to Natural England for. And the good thing about that is downstream of this gate, we have Ennardale Water, which all the partners between them own both the lake owned by United Utilities and the Lakeshore owned by Forestry, Forestry England National Trust and United Utilities. And then even down from that, there's another three kilometres river, which the partners own the banks of. So, we have a lot of control of the ground and the lake and the waterways below this should they escape should they start building lodges and dams the likelihood is it's still going to be on our land and we're going to catch them and return them back to the valley so that's how that gate we hope will work and we've been testing it for a year now so it lists the left gravel through the grill set at a, a 10 centimeter gap so that beavers can't get through but we do swap that out for a few months just so fish can spawn upstream and downstream and uh, we've talked to the environment agency water fisheries officers and they're quite happy to help with that and they'll tell us when the fish are sort of gathering together in the lake to spawn and then we can swap the gates out and um, we're showing you here three gates which are the experimental gates in if we do go ahead with this plan if the plan is taken forward then these gates would be extended across the whole length of the irish bridge you'll also see on this first picture that on the left hand side there's a metal structure that's actually it's not solid it's it's a grill again and that would be a, a, a low grill all running all the way along this left hand side and that really just stops any beavers from climbing out of the river onto the concrete bridge and then getting over that way while they're being stopped as they try and get under this is going to have to be there to stop them getting out on the upstream side of the bridge if we look at a few of the habitats that are already in the valley that would be suitable for beavers so this is uh this is moss dub Probably the prime site for beavers. This is a four star hotel quality beaver uh, lodge potential. And you can see it's got lovely open water, plenty of food around because they like the willow and the birch that's growing all around this lovely tarn. So that would be one site. And in the middle of Gillithwaite Field, so this is sort of down from the field centre and Y Chay, between the field centre and Y Chay and the main river Liza. The field centre and Y Chay are off to the right. And the lies is off to the left, so we're looking west down through these fields. There's this uh, beck that flows right the way through the fields, and this would be ideal for beavers to uh, dam. They're unlikely to dam river lies because it's too wide and too dynamic, but this this would definitely be dammable, and they're likely to start flooding these fields and then building more channels and canals to create more networks of pools that they can use to get to food. Is another example of that same water course further down where uh, a tree's died and fallen over and you can see that how that would be the starting place for a dam a beaver dam and that would flood out either side and, and they would start making access of that making use of that to get to new places and we could add to that by planting willow aspen birch in that area once they've started flooding things uh, to give them more food sources as well this is on the edge of the fields down from the field center the river lies is to the left and to the right there's a copse of aspen in the field there and again you've got this is outflow from the river liza that's spilling over the edge of the liza into this um, depression and forming another little stream and again the beavers might dam this and create a new water new uh, set of pools all the way up this little stream 
is in the middle of the fields and down from the wine chase. So the fields are all outside of this little copse. So the predominant species in here are aspen, which beavers love. So they might be tempted to come into this copse. And actually within this copse, there's a whole series of channels which are regularly full of water, just the ideal depth for beavers, and they might dam it. And as they fell the aspen, that will start coppicing and, and create a much more multi-structured woodland than we currently have. Thank you for your patience and for listening to us. We're now going to stop the recording. I'll stop sharing and uh, we'll see if there are any questions and answers. Let me just stop sharing. Find the uh, thing and then I'll stop recording. And stop recording, stop recording there.